Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Hare and Forbes Machinery House and Pace Farm. It's been a while since Route 66 has featured on the show. It's 2,448 miles of American highway history across eight states and three time zones. And you're about to see more highlights on this week's episode of Classic Restos. Moving west on day 10 of the Shannon's Route 66 tour for 2019. We're just outside of Amarillo here in Texas and we arrive at Cadillac Ranch. This place always amazes me. It seems to attract more people than what you'd find at a $1.99 buffet. It was created by three guys back in 1974, Chip Lord. Hudson Marquez and Doug Michels. Now, these guys were part of the art group named Ant Farm. 10 caddies, half buried, 1949 through to 1963 models, nose first. They were either used cars or cars from a junkyard back in the day. In a line, they clearly show, I guess, the artistry spanning the successful generations of the car, including the evolution of their tail fins. Not only that, to me, buried like that, when it comes time for working on their differentials, whew, that's just made a snack. <music> Moving west along Route 66, as you do, we've finally made it to the midpoint, which is Adrian here in Texas. And the midpoint representing 1139 miles in each direction. Back to Chicago and west to Los Angeles. Just down old Route 66 from the Midpoint Cafe here at Adrian in Texas is an original service station or a gas station behind me. Despite the fact there's a 1970s Chevy truck parked there, it'll give you an idea of the size of the gas station back in the time. This was built back in the late 20s. You can still see a Bowser there and um, the mounting points for an awning, the footings in the concrete. This is the interesting stuff when you do 66. You just stand here and, and think about the volume of traffic that went past here back in those times. We spoke to an old lady back in the cafe who was working one of the diners along here in up to 1971. It was literally hundreds and hundreds of meals a day would go out. They used to have to put extra staff on sometimes because it was just so busy before the interstate over there came through and bypassed 66. It had a, a massive effect thousands and thousands of businesses along the route went broke, pending their financial situations at the time. Businesses that were owned had a better chance of surviving. The businesses that were high in debt, well, unfortunately they went out the door backwards. Uh, there's a lot of good stories and sad stories along 66. The history though is paramount, it really is. And it's these old road sections here that really take the cake. One of my favourite places along Route 66 were in Deaf Smith County. So, sorry? Deaf. Deaf Smith County. Yep. Deaf. Yeah. That'd make a great location for the head office of a hearing aid company, I know. It's one of my favourite towns along Route 66. Glen Rio, here in Texas. Glen Rio started as a, a little town in 1903. Uh, Route 66 came along in 1926. It's a ghost town, which makes it one of my favourites. Uh, you look at the, the width of the road alignment here on 66, and it will typify how busy this must have been right through to its closure in 1973 when the interstate bypassed the town. The buildings left standing as the owners walked away. Travellers left as they weren't travelling Route 66 anymore. It's like as though when you see the motel up there and the service station there, you can still feel the presence of those thousands of people that used to frequent places such as this. Mm -hmm. 
Moving through this Route 66 highlights episode of Classic Restos, and we've made it to Santa Rosa here in New Mexico. And there's one place that you just have to see, and I must say it's a little bit of a favorite of mine as well, and that is the Route 66 Auto Museum. Let's go on inside and take another look. Once inside, I always love coming back here, and I've got Anna behind me. Have a go at her workstation. Now that is a 1957 desk that I wouldn't mind driving. Yeah, you gotta love a place like this. One good thing about returning to the Auto Museum here in Santa Rosa is that every time you come back, year to year, the display and what they have for sale is always different. Well, we've just entered Arizona this morning, having left Gallup in New Mexico. And this particular piece of alignment is the first time I've actually stopped uh, and filmed here. Route 66, original alignment, left as is. Uh, quite a, a windy section, and the two yellow lines still extremely visible, designating America's Highway from back in the day. Easy to see why there's no overtaking here as well. Route 66 can be very, very twisty in parts although the main highway. All the more reason, as population grew, more traffic, it just made more and more sense to develop the interstate. Quite often the interstate can run very close to Route 66, in fact right next door. The I-40 is only a, literally a few hundred metres that way, as we make our way west on Route 66. We've always had a few cars. They're all special. The T-Bird. Oh, that's mine. The Combi for when we want to get away. The XR8. It's going to be a classic. They're all insured with Shannon's. We've also got Shannon's home and contents cover. Which helps protect our automotive collectibles, tools and memorabilia in the home and garage. If you're motoring enthusiasts like us, it's got to be. Shannon's. Shannon's. Insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Call 13 46 46 for a quote. If you have a restoration project, Hair and Forbes has the tools that you need. Shrinker stretchers, dollies, mallets, bead rollers, profile gauges, professional panel restoration kits, and so much more. Now I warn you, enter at your own risk because you will end up buying something. So come along to your Cap City store or browse and buy online at machineryhouse.com.au because Hair and Forbes has the range. You know, as you make your way along Route 66, there's just so much to see and do. Now that we are in the state of Arizona, the Petrified Forest National Park is just a must-see. It's around a 26-mile loop, and it comprises the Petrified Forest and also the Painted Desert. It's millions and millions of years old. Dropped like a blanketed kaleidoscope of colours over the terrain, the painted desert offers a strangely beautiful landscape. Erosion has sculpted and shaped intriguing landforms, revealing multi-coloured layers. It's a geologist's chapter book, as the rocks reveal a chronicle of time over the past 225 million years. This is really cool stuff, this is. Some of the historic Route 66 alignment runs through the Petrified Forest National Park here. And to mark where the road went through, they've put this beloved 1932 Studebaker here for the occasion. And I just think that that is so neat. Another uh, giveaway or a telltale as to where old roads ran is a line of telegraph poles. This is also interesting as well because back in the time often telegraph poles used to follow the contours of the roadways. Not just Route 66 but other roads as well. And here you can see the, the wires, well they're long gone but the poles still remain. We are now in the amazing petrified forest and it was here that wood was turned into stone. 
one of the most incredible sights, turning timber into stone. Around 60 million years ago, the Colorado Plateau was gradually uplifted. Prior to that, trees once lined the riverbanks. The trees died and the river undercut the root system. The trees then fell over and travelled up the river. Sediment then covered the logs and rapid burial sealed the trees away from bacteria and oxygen, inhibiting decay. Mineral rich groundwater then percolated through the logs, depositing minerals. The fossilised logs then weathered out of the surrounding rocks. They contained quartz, making them hard and brittle. And as they were under so much pressure, they then snapped like carrots into sections. And these petrified pieces are with us today. making our way west along Route 66. We're now in the township of Williams, a fairly significant town because on the 13th of October in 1984, this was in fact the last town where the doors were closed as it was bypassed by the Interstate 40. It's got some advantages here in Williams. It's the gateway to the Grand Canyon. And now, because Historic 66 runs through the town, Williams has become a tourist mecca. There are many natural landmarks around the world that depict some of the greatest earthly masterpieces. To me, the Grand Canyon is almost paramount. Carved by the Colorado River in a would-be violent time, as land upheaval of around 5 to 13,000 feet displaced water and sent billions of kilolitres out towards the oceans, an almost hydraulic effect of gushing water has left the witness mark, representing many beautiful exposed levels of rock that we see in front of us today. Nearly 40 identified rock layers form the Grand Canyon's walls. History seeking began here in 1858. Most layers are exposed through the canyon's 277 mile length and these layers represent the chapters of time. The Grand Canyon is up to 6,000 feet deep, some 1.8 kilometres. Most scientists agree that the Grand Canyon was carved 6 million years ago, until a study in 2012 used new data to argue that the canyon was actually 12 times that. It's an outstanding landmark, a timeless one. Although Route 66 does not run directly to the canyon, it does run close by and it played a big part in transporting people here over many decades. Making our way through this special highlights edition of Route 66 on Classic Restos. Now, when you travel the route and you go through Seligman, you just have to see this guy. Now, Angel, you're no stranger to Classic Restos. You've been on a few times over the years. Thank you for joining me again. How are you? Like a brand new baby. That was your line last time. Well, I always feel like a brand new baby. Over 90 years of age, you're such an integral part of Route 66. Now, many years ago, uh, you told me the story of the feeling when the interstate passed Seligman. Just remind us of that afternoon when the traffic stopped. About this time of the day, September 22nd, 1978, traffic stopped. Our government finished building 100 miles of freeway from Kingman to Ash Fork, and we're sitting right in the middle of it, and all the traffic went to I-40, and the town died for 10 long years. History says there were 9,000 automobiles using this route here through Seligman. For years and years and years, I talked about, to anyone that would listen to me, how we could get the economy back. And my simple thought was, we asked the state to make Route 66 historic from Seligman to Kingwin. I took it to the Chamber of Commerce, and I was the president of the Chamber of Commerce. No one listened. I told my wife, Vilma, let's get in the car and go to Kingwin. Stop at the Grand Canyon Caverns. We'll stop at Peach Springs. We'll stop at Truxton. 
We'll stop at, at the Chamber of Commerce in Kingman, and let's see what they think about my idea. I was endorsed by everyone. Finally got the attention of the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber called the first meeting February the 8th, 1987, at 1 o'clock at the Grand Canyon Caverns. Forty-six people came to the meeting from as far away as Arizona-California border. I presided at the meeting for one whole hour. Nothing happened. I walked out of that meeting, and I called that now famous meeting for February the 18th, 1987, here in Seligman, the Copper Cart Restaurant, which is a gift shop now, at 1 o'clock. I called as many people whose phone numbers I had. Fifteen people showed up. I presented at the meeting. Bingo! We formed the first ever, the historic Route 66 Association of Arizona. We were hard-pressed to tell the world Route 66 is not dead. Angel, I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking you once again. It's always a pleasure uh, to interview you on Classic Restos. Thank you so much for your time, and you take care of yourself, hey? Oh, Fletch, I, I just want to tell you something. Thank you for doing this, because when you put this out to the world, more and more people are going to be so happy to hear about Route 66 and the work you're doing. Thank you, Fletch. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for being such a massive part of Route 66, Angel, okay? I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled beyond words. Thank you. Good on you, mate. Well done. I spend a lot of time out here. The RT charge is the real deal. An E49. Remember A Charger? I've always got projects on the go, so Shannon's laid up cover helps protect my restorations. I'm Mopar through and through. It's a passion Shannon's understands. I wouldn't insure my cars and bikes with anyone else. Shannon's, insurance for motoring enthusiasts. Call 13 46 46 for a quote. Heron Forbes Machinery House has been family owned and operated for over 85 years and it's easy to see why. Planning on welding? Look at these welding tables and clamps, air compressors and different air tools, sandblasting cabinets, through to spray guns. Everyone is welcome at Machinery House. There are competitive freight rates around Australia and you can buy online at machinerymouse.com.au. So remember, Hare and Forbes has the range. As Route 66 ducks and weaves, we are now in the 1926 to 1952 alignment out of Kingman heading towards Oatman. This is some of the most twisty and mountainous parts of Route 66 that you will experience. And to think that by the time 1950 came around, around one million vehicles per year were coming through here. Often no Armco railing with sheer drop-offs. And that kept the attention, I'm sure, of the majority of Route 66 motorists. Through here was also the inspiration for Warner Brothers to create the iconic cartoons that we grew up with as kids, such as Coyote and the Roadrunner. After an exhilarating experience of driving historic Route 66 through the twisty stuff, complete with no Armco railing in most places, we end up in the once gold mining town of Oatman, just south of Kingman. The name of Oatman was designated in 1909. It was Blue Ridge Camp prior to that. This is really the only town left alone, almost replicating the locations of the spaghetti westerns that dominated our movie screens back in the late 50s and 1960s. Residing itself 2,700 feet above sea level, mining started around 1912, booming into the 1920s. By 1931, the area's mines had produced over 1.8 million ounces of gold. By the mid-1930s, the mining boom was over, and the mules seen here were used by the prospectors to haul rock and ore. After the mining era was over, the mules were released. These descendants are wild today, and they gracefully stroll back into the hills at night, then return to greet the tourists each day. With me now, Austin, how you doing? Fletch, I'm doing good. Well, what kind of outfit are you wearing today? You know, where's your shirt? What's well, going on? Well, well, 
20 days on the trip. I'm, I'm getting down to the bottom of the suitcase now. I think you're going to have a big laundry bill. <laughs> we stay here any longer, which we're glad we're here in America. That's great. Absolutely. I wanted to showcase this place. Um, tell me, Austin, the collection here, what, what did it really mean to Carol? Every time he walked in, was he, did he, was he still overwhelmed about what he had here? He was totally surprised that anybody would care about the cars from the 60s. And of course, he was very interested in the, in the current cars. But like the 289 Cobra behind me or, or any of the race cars or anything, he, the fact that we were interested in him or we'd go nuts over him, he'd look at us like, well, I figured that was over. I'm off to the new thing. Yeah. So he was, he was very much, he was very proud. He was very happy, you know. You, you knew the great man for a long time. Tell us, what was the feeling like back in the, in the early 60s when uh, well, the 289 Windsor, uh, the evolution of that, what a fantastic little V8 that was, the way it used to rev, it, was a, it really held its own. Um, was there an element of surprise as to how good the Windsors were back in those days? Somewhat, yeah, because Ford came out of the 50s with some really dead product. And one of the reasons they wanted to hire Carroll was the fact that he, he, he was going to put some excitement in their showrooms with the Cobra because they had a pretty boring product line. So when they came out with the 289 engine, and what was neat, the, well, the first year they raced, it was basically the 289 high performance engine, blueprinted of course, but it was a standard Ford cam. It was a standard bottom end, you know, it, was everything. it wasn't like some trick, you know, double throw down demon tweak engine. And that was one of the neatest things about the cars. They were running production parts. Well, Ford loved that. Plus they loved all the publicity they could get. And that engine proved to be, well, it was a world champion engine. I mean, it had them in the Daytona Coupes when they won the world championship in 1965. Austin, I have to ask you, tell me, where did, this? I mean, this is very surreal, here at, at Carroll Shelby's place here, uh, and to ask these questions firsthand, how did GT come about, those two letters, and how did the 350 come about? Well, the 350 was interesting. I, I asked Carroll that, and he, he told me, he said, look, he, said, you got, he started getting this grin on his face, that, oh, I'm dead. And he says, he says, Ford decided they wanted to name my car. He says, so they flew out, you know, you marketing guys out in a jet, in a corporate jet. He said, so they're sitting around the table for about an hour. I got tired of listening to all their yakking. So I asked my chief engineer, Phil Remington, who was designed and worked on all these cars, made them, made them good. He says, Phil, how so far, far is it from the race shop to the production shop? Phil comes back 350 yards, good, GT350. That's what we're going to name the car. The 50th anniversary car behind us, Austin. Tell us about that. We're big on anniversaries around here. So for the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Cobra in 2012, being that 1962 was the first you know, year they built them, we built 50 of these cars. They sold out in 48 hours. And people, and this is one of them behind us, who's um, one of our customers, a very dear friend, who is very kind enough to loan us the car here for the you know, Shelby Heritage Center. And uh, he comes, when he comes, he drives it around and he brings it back here and we, we park it here. So did they get a choice of colors or is it as, nope, as, we, as we see it? Just as like you that. saw it, as you see it there, that's yeah. exactly what you got. Yeah. You know, the black yeah. with the red interior. Austin, there's no doubt about it. You don't, you don't go to work every day, you go to hobby. That's correct, Fletch. You're 100% correct. We're standing here at the factory at Shelby American and this is where the cars come in after people order them or dealers order them. They come from Ford. It takes about 12 weeks to build them at the Ford factory. And then they come out here and they're transformed into either a Super Snake or a Shelby GT. Now, each car, when it starts, is, is uh, at a lift like you see here from start to finish. Two, either one or two techs will work on the car. We change the wheels, the tires, all the suspension, brakes, like on this car, the big Brembos. Um, a lot of the cars with superchargers. This particular one doesn't have one yet, but it, it will. Uh, the cooling system. It's a complete car. It's not just, well, we throw a supercharger on it, hey, let's go fast. It's everything's done to complement the whole vehicle to make it a real sports car. Austin, I really appreciate your time here this afternoon. Well, thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, great to meet you both, and, and uh, thanks for coming to Shelby American. We appreciate it. That's okay. You take care, Austin. Okay, you too, Fletch. Route 66 is not a road you just get on and drive. The challenge is to find old alignments, to stop, get out, and take in what we now take for granted. Route 66 is a mesh over time of good times for some, 
and very bad for many. Moving west in the time of depression for the better life in California, where some never made it, but those people and their families helped to build the towns we know today along the way. Route 66 carried people in both directions for decades. It was the highway for hitchhikers, the highway for military personnel, the highway that contained the most roadside attraction fun. It was the highway for holiday makers, truck drivers, motorbike riders, the humble sales rep, and of course a plethora of others that used the road, supporting many hundreds of Ma and Pa cafes and restaurants along with copious quantities of businesses along the way. It was the highway for the gas stations, the highway for the hotels if you could afford them in early times. It was the highway where travellers camped on the roadside, when travellers got together and shared their stories. The Eisenhower government started bypassing Route 66 with freeway systems back in 1955. The decline of the route was from there on. It took 30 years for the interstate systems to knock out the total use of Route 66, but today thousands of tourists every year relive the road, as around 75% of it still remains. Route 66 takes you through a kaleidoscope of landscapes, green belts, rocky mountains, deserts, townships, cities. You meet characters along the way. You make friends and you never forget those friends. Route 66 may not be the oldest road. It may not be the longest road, but it is the road that has received the most press. Well, I trust that you've really enjoyed these Route 66 highlights episodes of Classic Restos. As I say at the end of every week's show, until next week, please ride and drive safe. I'm Fletch, and I thank you very much for watching. You can like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash classic restos TV and watch catch up episodes at shannons.com.au. Classic Restos is proudly brought to you by Shannons, insurance for motoring enthusiasts, Hare and Forbes Machinery House, and Pace Farm.